everybody for coming. Uh, we really appreciate you joining in us in this brand new event. Um, we've been preparing this for quite some time now. It's been a couple months uh, that this has been going on and we're really excited to have you all here. My name is Rebecca Caldwell. I am moderating the event today. I'm not, I'm not gonna be doing as much as Chris is who is sharing her slides, but I'm just gonna be working a bit in the background along with Nicole Wagner. Um, I am the technical program director for the AAPG Women's Network. I'm also a geologist at Chevron. And my background is in um, geomorphology, so surficial processes, and those, those are very much related to wine. And I love drinking wine, so I was really excited when Chris, <laughs> when, when Chris had the idea to have this event. And so it's been wonderful working with Chris and our other panelists uh, to build this event. So the other people uh, that you will be seeing a lot of today, as I already mentioned, one of them is Chris, Chris Piella Cox, who will introduce herself soon. We also have uh, William Nardine, Tiffany, sorry, Tiffany Farrell and Fran Pontash. And uh, I will let them all introduce themselves in a bit. But first I wanna say a quick thank you to everyone else who put a lot of effort into this event today. That would include uh, Nicole Wagner and Rochelle Kernan, who are the APG Women's Networks, Women's Network co-chairs. And we also had a lot of help from other people at APG, including Gretchen Flint, who made our advertisement and Heather Hodges and Susie Nolan. So thank you, everybody. Um, what else do I wanna say before we leave? Right, as I said, this event today is co-hosted by the, or I said it was already, I said it was hosted by the American, by the APG Women's Network. It is in fact co-hosted with AWG. Chris will say something about that quickly. Could somebody from APG Women's Network drop a link to join in the chat? I'd really appreciate that help. So if you're interested in joining and you're not already a participant, once somebody drops that link into the chat, you can go there and join. Um, what's the last thing I wanted to say? Oh, one more thing. This one's pretty important. Just take a quick note. Um, you saw when you signed in that this event is being recorded, uh, but we just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. And uh, we do hope to uh, load this to our new YouTube page. We finally have a YouTube page where we are hosting all of our webinar content. And so you can go to that page. If someone wants to help me out and drop that link in the chat, I'd really appreciate it. And you could go there and check out some of the other content we have and some future content like the geology of beer, which we are already planning. And so if you enjoy today, hopefully <laughs> you'll come back for the geology of beer. Okay. All right, I think that's all I have today. This is like the most you're gonna hear me talking today. But um, so I'm gonna pass it off to Chris now. She will be leading this for the most part along with our other panelists. Um, she's gonna talk about everything we're gonna to do today, uh, but she's gonna start off with a poll. Um, however, throughout the event, please feel free to drop questions in the chat. Our panelists will try to answer them there or every now and then as I'm moderating, I might interrupt the speakers and tell them we've got some important questions. Overall though, today's meant to be fun, laid back, and we will have a networking event halfway through. So you'll meet new people face to face. All right, like I said, that's the most you'll hear from me today. So cheers. <laughs> Thanks for that. Chris, take it away. I haven't started drinking yet because I want to make it through my slides, but I would love if you guys could go to the uh, website, menti.com. Please put in where you're from. We just want to get a general idea of everyone that's with us today. We advertise this internationally for the AAPG Women's Network, and it's been really fun planning it and getting all the people you see today, all the panelists together. So you should be able to see where we're at. We've got um, Rome, we've got a bunch of people from Texas, we've got someone from Chile, Minnesota, Denver, Go ahead and put in where you're from or where you're calling in from today. Awesome. Lots of Texas. Yeah, and it's a word cloud. So if you actually type it city comma, country it'll actually make the word bigger because it'll match the other people so it'll the biggest words will be where we have the most people from so it's kind of it's kind of fun to see 
Winnipeg Geological Society. Is, is anybody doing it like together as a group? Like you got your shots and you're all like COVID safe and you're, you're doing your tasting together as a, as a group. You know, when you go buy four bottles of wine, sometimes it's like, well, do I want to open all four of these all by myself? And of course, yes, <laughs> right answer. But, you know, sometimes you may want to share with your friends. <laughs> See a couple groups in the in the video feed. Yeah. Everyone calling in from Europe. I know it's pretty late. Okay, I'm going to go into the next one. Okay, what are your two favorite wines? So you can submit two separate answers for this. So you can put uh, Sangiovese and Malbec or Riesling and Moscato. Ooh. Ooh, we've got a lot of Pinot Noir things. Fantastic. William, lots of Pinot Noir things. Take note for the next time. Take note for the next one. Yeah, we'll do Pinot. We can do a whole panel of Pinot Noir next time and just compare Ooh. different wines from different regions. Oregon versus France. Oh, I love it. Oh, this is so fun. I need to... Um, Rebecca, would you please capture images of the word clouds? I think that would be really fun. Yes. Screen, screen captures. Hi all, if you can, try to enter your responses in the Menti poll. Uh, I'll drop the link back in the, in the chat. Oh yes, thank you. All right, shall we move to the next one? My, my, I should have mentioned my other job during this event is to try my best to keep us moving because we do have a lot to accomplish. You do, yeah, thank you for keeping me on track. I'm gonna crack that whip and try, try to keep us in order. Ooh, what's this? This is going to give us an idea of how uh, how specific we need to get into soil details. Obviously, the slide packs are already made, but we can dive into more details if you guys if you guys want. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so we should have a lot of geoscientists in the in the crowd since this is advertised to AWG and the APG. So most people do some serious some serious soil if you've got it. If you're an avid gardener, if it's pretty occur, and then if it was intro classes in grad school. That's mostly, that's most of our background. So that's good. I'm trying to go to the next slide. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. All right, this is the last question. It's a question about what your knowledge of wine is. It's just gonna ask you how much you know about wine. There's no correct answer. It's just how Menti built the poll. All answers are correct answers. Awesome. Okay, great. So we have a lot of people that have been to the news before. Someone doesn't know what wine is, so that's, we're going to work on that today. We're going to learn a lot about wine today. <laughs> and um, yes, I, I really am so excited that someone is trying to use my way. All right, I'm going to switch screens. We're going to switch back over to the PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll go. We'll do some introductions. Yeah, we can see the PowerPoint. All right. All right, William, do you want to start? And then we'll just go down the list. It'll be William, Tiffany, Fran, myself, and then Rebecca already did her introduction. Sure, thank you. Sir. Sure. So I'm uh, William Nardin. I'm uh, an assistant professor at the University of Maryland on the on point. And I'm working uh, on the boundary between ecology, geomorphology. I'm, a, I'm a, an environmental engineer by training, but uh, Recently, I'm working a lot on geomorphology, and uh, that that was uh, why I got in contact with this group of uh, scientists. So, and then also, uh, I grew up in. Uh, uh, so I lived for 20 years 
close by of Vinihar because my parents owned a Vinihar for 20 years. So I, I would say that I grew up in a place where I saw like, a, you know, uh, I learned how grapes are grown, how they are picked, how they are pressed, how they are bottled, how, how, the, how the wine is aged. And, uh, you know, traveling also around the world, having in my background experience in familiar uh, vineyard helped a lot to develop my knowledge of wine. And uh, I did a lot of studies my, uh, on my own, especially after I got my uh, class, uh, my first class as a sommelier. And uh, during the class, I got an, a notebook. And my goal was to fill up all pages of this notebook with all the wines I tried all around the world. That's it. Hey, Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tiffany Carroll, and I am a winemaker. And I work, I work at a winery in Mount Vineyard, a winery in Santa Fe, Texas, in Salinas County. Um, so the very first of our two years to other wineries in the state of Texas. Uh, we do have a very small vineyard. Um, it's three acres, but maybe at this point, um, only two acres producing um, and they grow adult swans um, and a very different sort of like um, environment than you would think. Um, most people would say we can't, we could be growing grapes that we are, but we did anyway. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here to provide a winemaker perspective of the HP experience. We're going to have to work on your sound, Tiffany. It's super hard to hear you. No. <laughs> what we did earlier. You have to hold your head just so I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Fran, you're up. Um, I'm Fran Pontash, and I'm the viticulturist for the Gulf Coast in Texas for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And um, I began um, in grad school in 1979 because I was interested in Pierce's disease, a very important disease for grapes. Um, but then I took a, a bit of a hiatus for a while, but um, uh, re-entered in the Davis Mountains of Texas. And um, I've uh, been in vineyards, you know, all over Texas and, and grown grapes and had to, you know, actually see them through. And um, we call ourselves in Texas, like we're at the forefront of climate adversity. So, um, and then we've got, I don't know, 1100 different soil profiles and stuff. So um, we, we just get it all. So um, I'm interested to see, I'm, I'm here to learn too. And I wanna know more about the wine. Thanks, Brian. All right, my name is Chris Wilcox. I'm a geologist with a background in marine geology, and I'm an exploration geoscientist at BP, and I work in the Gulf of Mexico. And three years ago, my husband and I decided to plant a vineyard in Texas. So I'm going to talk to you guys about the crossover between petroleum geology, soil science, and how to grow a vineyard. And Fran and Tiffany can jump into and talk to you about like the specifics of growing vines in your yard if you're interested in that and the dynamics in, in that area. And you can always come see my vineyard. It's in East Texas on the Louisiana border. Okay, and we're good. So I'm gonna go into the next slide, Rebecca, if that's okay with you. Uh, a okay, go, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> All right, let's open your bottles. William, do you want to go through how to properly open a bottle of wine for us? And William, you got to stand close to your microphone because it's hard to hear you with the kitchen echoing. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, so, I can hear you. Perfect, perfect. So the, the, um, so the, the first specific uh, change is, like, uh, is between this one, <laughs> it's almost offensive for um, sommelier, and this one is the, you know, the, the real one. The one you should use every time. So it's uh, you know two steps, and all the other parts to open the bottle. And you know, of course, there is a, a an etiquette by the sommelier. So it's uh, it's not only bottle opener, but also how you show your, your bottle. And uh, you know, there is essentially like a, it's also like something formal that you have to do for opening the your bottle. So I. I have here the, the terminer, the wood terminer that I want to open 
later. And uh, so it's good to open now all the bottle because you need the oxygen for the wine to get flavors and uh, oxidation and like uh, to get better later for. So, and uh, the, first, the first thing like a, a half a centimeter down the top, you should turn like all around leaving, sorry, the label in front. So, because, you know, if you are, of course, I'm not in a restaurant, but even with friends, you should show the bottle. So, and then turn again. And once you come here on the top, you have to turn 45%. And this coming out by itself. So you don't need to do any crazy stuff. And then perpendicularly to the cork, get your bottle opener and go in and turn all the way down, but not, not all the way down because otherwise we, we're gonna um, go over the other side of the cork. We don't want to uh, add anything inside the, the wine. So first step. And and I, I'm gonna quickly interrupt. Chris, could you stop sharing your, the slides so that we could see William bigger? Sorry, there was some chatter about it in the chat yeah. box and there we go, yay. Okay, thank you. Going back up here. So, and then get in here, second step, and you open all the way up. Then checking the bottom part of the cork to see if there is any signs of mold or any losing parts. And then you can smell and see that if uh, there is anything like weird inside. So, and this is how to open like a professional kind of the, the bottle. And the, the other part is, uh, is in the slide that you can, you know, there's a, there is a, a figure showing uh, the tongue because uh, all the different parts of the tongue, the, uh, the buds are really important because they can sense differently from salty to bitter, to sour, to sweet. So it's really important when you get your sip for testing the wine, to flow around your tongue so you can capture all the flavors that you wanna see, you know, that you wanna capture on the wine. So that's it for now. And then, you know, we're gonna start with Chardonnay, the Wistraminer, Chianti, and Malbec. So if you wanna pour your first glass, go ahead and pour your Chardonnay. Sorry? We're pouring Chardonnay, William. <laughs> Yes, go, go for it, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so this is the order we're gonna taste the wines in and we're gonna start with Chardonnay, which we're gonna have throughout the lecture. We're gonna go through the slides around 4.30, 4.35. We're gonna uh, talk about the Chardonnay that we're gonna have with Gerstraminer. We're gonna do a little networking breakout, have some water, a bio break, maybe get some crackers or some bread, you know. And then we'll um, jump back into the big group at uh, 505 so we can do the red tasting. During the presentation, please use the chat box to ask questions. Fran, William, and Tiffany are all gonna be active in the chat box so they can answer questions as we go along. So we're ready to, ready to jump in. Okay. So a lot of us being petroleum geologists or taking geology in school at some point, you learn about the Kimmeridge clay super famous source rock. Um, it's a very famous time of deposition for two reasons. Um, not only is it a major oil source rock, but it's also a major contributor to the French wine industry. In the North Sea, super famous for oil and gas, you've got 95% of petroleum is generated from this source rock. This is a picture of it on the left-hand side. You can see it's shaly, it's dark, and on the right hand side, this is what it looks like in France in the Champagne and the Chablis region. All right, so it's the source for nearly all Champagne in France. And on the left side, you can see it, it's very like marine clay. And on the right side, it's a dark chalky model with layers of limestone. And you can even see the, the, the shells in there. You can see what looks like oysters and bivalves. So we've got nice oyster banks over here in France. And then you've got this shaly, very compacted clay on the left side with actual chordate fossils in it. So crocodiles and sauropods and ichthyosaurs and tons of ammonites. This formation is super famous for ammonites in the outcrops in the UK. 
So you can see it's, it's upper Jurassic about, 100 and, about 152 million years ago. So very interesting. When you think in your head, well, France is really close to the UK. Why are they so drastically different? Because that is a that's a massive difference to have an oil source rock right next to a limestone where you can where you grow champagne. And this is why. So on the left hand side, you can see the um, Colorado Plateau Geosystems paleo uh, paleo reconstruction. And you can see the gray outlines are the current country borders as they exist today. So you can see Great Britain is here. You guys can see my, if you cannot see my cursor, just uh, just let me know, put it in the, put it in the chat and Rebecca can flag me down. Uh, but here's the, here's the modern UK here. And then here's modern France where the, the gold star is. And you can see up here, there's a, there's a lot of isolation in between the land masses and France is much more open to the open sea. There's a deep seaway cutting through kind of like you know, what cuts around Florida currently, the, the straits. So you've got all this really beautiful, um, open, shallow marine, like imagine the Caribbean. You've got like 150 million years ago, France was like the Caribbean. Whereas up here in the UK, it was like gross, moral, gross, uh, gross marshy, swampy kind of land. So the Cambridge was deposited in a relatively deep fault bounded uh, set of marine basins, which was ideal Yes, we need a champagne trip to the Caribbean. I agree, Rebecca. Ideal for uh, anaerobic conditions. So just really gross, basically. And the oils are very high in sulfur, five to 8%. So this is on the, on the upper right-hand side, you can see how it was, it was really, really isolated over here. You've got the open tethys to the south, the sea. And then up here where the um, North Sea is currently, you've just got complete bounded marine conditions. And Comparatively, you can see how drastically this changes. On the bottom right, down here where it's green, this is, this is modern France. And you can see there's a bunch of chalk deposition down here compared to all the clay in the north. So even being so close as they were in deposition, um, they are just completely different uh, today. And that's why there is such a, such a difference in what these rocks are known for. Um, so we are uh, moving on to soil impact. I'm glad that we have a lot of people that garden and have a background in soil. I saw someone mention that the color chart, I remember in undergrad having to carry this thing around and just being the bane of my existence. I was like, I can't believe we have to carry this heavy color chart notebook. And it was always a, a binder and it was so heavy and it was so frustrating we had to carry it around. <laughs> So maybe you, you remember learning about soil color charts and also soil horizons. So on the left-hand side, you can see the horizons if you did take an in-depth soil, soil class. But um, soils are like multivitamins for plants. When we learned about erosion in undergrad, we went through how parent rocks break down via physical and chemical erosion to generate soil. We also learned to back estimate what the provenance or input source was for our soil or a reservoir based on what we know about erosion pathways, paleoclimate, and other factors like precipitation. These are very important because the parent rock is what determines the dominant minerals and how long the soil will hold moisture and what the soil can support, whether it's agriculture, whether that soil can support roads, whether it can support skyscrapers or vineyards. So soil science is a huge component and there's a lot of engineering fields and a lot of professional geologists, but this is specifically what they do is investigate the soil and the underlying bedrock. So why would source their nutrients and about the top half meter of sediment? So, you know, not, they don't go super, super deep unless they really need water. Water can be derived from deeper, which is up to two meters. So a little over, um, little over six feet. Grapevines require the same nutrients as a vegetable garden. So if you're a vegetable gardener now, you can easily transition into the vineyard lifestyle. I know it sounds romantic, but it's an insane amount of work. There's nitrogen. Um, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, iron, calcium. So I'm gonna pull you guys. So in the chat box, please put, if you needed potassium, what rock types would you get this from? If you wanted, if you had like a, a provenance rock that you needed potassium to come in from, like nearby, not, not long distance transport. If you needed some potassium, what rocks would you want? Yeah. Bananas, I like bananas, pegmatite, bananas, and arcos. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, there you go, Mary. Case bar. <laughs> Potassium feldspar, spectite, mica, illite, vermiculite. If you are an avid gardener, I know you've heard of vermiculite. The next one, phosphorus. If you need phosphorus, what are you going to use? Put it in the chat box. Maybe one of the panelists can answer. My question above. Maybe the chats are not coming in at the same order. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, let's regurgitate them some great scientists. They're so shallow. That's a question. That might be a question for Fran and Tiffany up there. Bakwano. Yeah. Bakwano is good for nitrogen. Chicken litter, uh, compost, bakwano. That's all really high in nitrogen. So, what are some rocks that are high in phosphorus? Phosphate, flora appetite, appetite, francolite, mostly appetite. We're going to talk about appetite a little bit more. There you go. Carla's on it. Phosphorite, yeah, Maria's got it. Francolite, francolite, like fran <laughs> pontash, sorry. <laughs> magnesium, the cheapest way to get magnesium in your soil is Epsom salt. Dolomite, limestone, mafic igneous rocks, those are good ones. If you need iron, what would you what would you put if you needed some iron? What are some what are some good ones? Basalt, cedarite, yeah, good ones. Hematite, right, magnetite, yeah, exactly. Got it. Igneous rocks, there you go. Mafic, magnetite, glauconite. Glauconite's a good one too, because since these conditions where the Kimmeridge was deposited were marine, that's where you get a lot of glauconite. So that's very helpful because otherwise um, you can also, limestone a lot of times is actually deficient in iron. So that's one of the issues. If you need to add iron to your soil, how would you go about doing that? Calcium, easy one, right? Dolomite and limestone. So all this uh, information is is sourced is sourced online. It's uh, in, pre in publications that are available. So if you guys are interested, you can you can totally go look all this up. <laughs> all right. So can you grow grapevines in your backyard knowing all this information? Do you want to? So DB Texas, where I live, is definitely not Napa. Not even close. Red clay, where we are, and if you live. In any region of the South, you know that red clay is very prominent and you know that your garden does not necessarily care for it. Red clay is generally acidic, high in iron, and it can be severely lacking in essential nutrients. And because the acidity is so high, the pH is low, right? So it has trouble absorbing other nutrients. So if you've ever worked in your soil lab when you're an undergrad, or if you're really avid into soil now, and this is part of your career, you've sent in samples to a soil laboratory. So here's two samples that I got last year. And these are from the same plant location in the vineyard. So I don't know if anybody went to SFA. SFA has a good soil lab. UMass in Massachusetts has an awesome ag extension. So if you're on the East Coast, that's a good option. You can send your samples up to UMass. I also send samples to Texas A&M. I send them through different places because as you can see, the numbers are a little bit different, even though these are the same sample because the soil labs all have a different procedure and process for how they run their samples. So what's the major issue here? What is our problem? Hmm, let me think. Based on these, uh, these charts, I know it kind of gives it away on the bottom right, but what's the, what's the, big, uh, the big issue here? pH is definitely low. It's 4.5. We've got some. Uh, we've got some serious issues with phosphorus. So, if you are a geologist, which we, which most of us are, how would a geologist solve this deficiency? If you're low in phosphorus, what's a, what's the most effective way to increase your phosphorus? What, what rock were we thinking about earlier? That is. The most common thing that has a lot of phosphorus in it. I know, I know we hate going back to mineralogy and thinking about mineralogy. I know it's like this. This is my least favorite lab. I actually sold that book with me as a lab before. <laughs> so rock phosphate. And if you're in the if you're in mining or if you've ever done mining or an internship in mining, this is uh, this is one of the more common mined rocks that you find. And then 
Um, you also see it, um, it's part of appetite. Yeah, so very good, very good Maria, awesome. So calcium phosphate forms under a super wide variety of conditions. So it's found all over the place, including Amazon and Ace Hardware. <laughs> so you can get it igneous, which I misspelled, metamorphic, sedimentary. Um, it was our famous 101 lab. Appetite is five on Mohs hardness scale. So that would have been whatever, you, whenever you do your scratch test, the appetite was five. Um, commonly in limestones and mudstones, so very good when you say limestone, there you go, ocean floor, near shore marine, lacustrine, generally low energy environment is when you just settle out. Um, it's also, if you find really nice appetite crystals, they're also sold for jewelry. They're really commonly sold. Um, phosphate nodules and, and crusts are very common. It's commercially mined all over the planet. So the closer, the closer you can get it to where you need it, the cheaper it's going to be because obviously if you've ever flown with rocks, which obviously if you've gone on field trips, all of us have, you know it's very expensive because they're very heavy to transport them if your baggage has ever gone overweight because you just had to bring that last hand sample home in your in your carry-on bag or your check or your checked bag. <laughs> 90 percent of rock phosphate production is actually for fertilizer and animal feed supplements. So rock phosphate is a huge industry. So it's it's definitely a big deal. So this is all this is all a culmination of how our, our background in geoscience and how we understand mineralogy comes into play when you're planting a vineyard, which will then eventually become wine, because there's it's so integrated, all the sciences between the, the chemistry and the microbiology with the microbes. And Tiffany can even talk about that if you have any specific microbe questions related to wine. There's tons of microbes in the soil, and then there's microbes in the wine too. And then all our geologic and soil knowledge comes full circle. So we had a really nice suggestion for a vacation for someone that's on the call right now. Elena is a professor in Canada. Um, and she suggests that we all go on vacation to visit here. This is Cambrian and Ordovician Schist in France, where you can actually find trial bites and they're on display and you can drink wine. You can drink red wine in France and look at trilobites and Ordovician shifts. So I feel like this needs to be a sponsored field trip as soon as we can travel internationally again today. So thank you, Elena, for the submission. Is Elena here? Elena, where are you? Yeah, I think she's on the call. She's the associate. Director. Yes, I, yes, I'm here. Wait, thank if you. your video is on wave, if not, thank you so yes. much for your, for your addition. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I was happy to to contribute. Yeah. It's a, a, huge, a nice geology. Actually, the Montagne Noir or Black Mountain. It's a overturned large um, large fold, which is like about five kilometers of thick of Cambrian beds and Ordovician beds. And on on those soils, you they they grow in a nice wine, which is called Chistoy Sanchignan. Shisto means uh, grown on the sheets. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you, me. Elena. Um, Chris, I'm you are doing a great job of speeding through, and I really appreciate sticking to the time. I'm gonna go ahead and quickly ask just some questions that have been in the chat that were okay. not addressed. Okay. Um, because I want to make sure everybody knows that their questions are heard. Um, someone felt you know forgive my basic question but i don't know the answer to your basic question so it, you're not alone but they wanted to know if the soils you've been referring to are saprolite uh they you know you've been talking about rock properties but uh what is the relationship between some of the terms you've been using and the term saprolite and or one of the panelists if you guys have the answer to that See, maybe it wasn't that basic of a question. I don't know. <laughs> S-A-P-R-O-L-I-T-E. Yeah, saprolite. I don't know. I don't know. Well, while our panelists simmer on that, um, someone else asked if you can grow Concord grapes, can you grow wine grapes? Uh, it depends on where you are. Um, you, they will grow, you know, grapes grow almost anywhere and almost in any soil, but, um, and I, I talk soil because I'm not a geologist. I talk about the, the other part of, 
from after the rocks have broken down a bit, um, which is soil. And uh, it would depend on how well they grow because it might not produce or it might not, uh, it might get disease. It might um, produce something you're not really fond of, you know, because there is a taste depending on how well the plant grows, how well the vine grows. Thank you for that. Okay, those were the questions I just wanted to quickly throw in there. I will let you transition to tasting. Um, also, everybody in the chat, we during the tasting, we're doing a Q&A, so don't feel like I'm cutting you off. Keep throwing those questions in. Thanks, Roberta. So do great wines only grow on certain soils? So this is a very complicated question. With technology now, like we just went through how you can manually change the chemistry of the soil by adding dolomite, adding um, you know, powdered calcium carbonate. You can add stuff to change the pH. You can add all these other fertilizers, whether they're liquid or solid. The fertilizer industry is super high tech. So a lot of money to be made there. Um, there's a lot of factors, including climate, elevation, the slope of your land, the type of grape and the style of wine. And then Fran can even talk to you about the roots. You can, I'm sure you've seen roots, um, plants, uh, a lot of plants get grafted onto different roots and vines, grapevines are the same way and that you can graft a great, a different grapevine onto a different grape root. And then it's just, it's really incredible all the hybrids they can make. So do earthy flavors in wine come from the soil? I know when you've, you've done the, you've seen fancy wine taste things and people talk about how things are earthy, but um, no, it doesn't really have much to do with the soil. And I think Tiffany can talk about how the microbes actually impact the taste of the wine. I think there's, a, there's not a lot of scientific backing for wine taste being directly related to the soil. The soil is just really important for nutrients. Like I said earlier, soil is the multivitamin for the plant itself. And it's gonna affect how vigorous the plant grows and how like, how, you know, the, the actual like success of the grapes themselves. So that's the main component we wanna focus on. So for today's tasting, we're doing a tour of deposition. There's tons of different depositional environments and they are, they're all very interesting. So here we go. Uh, Napa Chardonnay, so that's our first one. Then we're going to jump over to Germany for the Gerstraminer. And then we'll have Tuscan Chianti and Malbec from Mendoza. So we're going all around the world. We've got three in the Northern Hemisphere and one in the Southern Hemisphere. So for a general comparison of soils, since we're starting with Napa down here with Chardonnay, there's clay loam and sandy loam soils. In the very beginning, Fran mentioned how many soil types we have in Texas. Up in Napa, they have so many. They have almost as many. It's crazy. Um, their volcanic and marine origin, it's, it's, it's super mixed. It's, it's really, really interesting. There's tons of reading you can do on Napa soils or just take a trip to Napa and you can learn more about them in person because everyone loves a field trip with wine. Um, the second one we're gonna do Mosul Valley, Germany. So there's a lot of slate there. A lot of metamorph metamorphosis happens. <laughs> there's a, um, well-drained is, is definitely is definitely important because you don't want your roots to drown. And then since Germany is rather cold most of the year compared to a lot of the other wine growing regions that we know of. So this is really beneficial for the cold weather that the slate holds the heat. There's a lot of natural microbes also in the slate like yeast and bacteria and they thrive and they help uh, apparently find the taste of minerality which Tiffany can probably speak to more. So before we, um, Tuscany has a lot of clay, climbed limestone and bold Sangiovese wines are very famous from Tuscany. They also have fast draining soils. And then Mendoza is alluvial. And I'm gonna show you a soil picture of um, the alluvial soils in Mendoza and they are wild. It looks like a mass transport complex. It's like so poorly sorted. It's, it's, it would be a complete conglomerate if it was, if it was cemented. It's so cool. So um, lots of, Everything from sand, clay, and pebbles, um, and middle Triassic origin, lots really low organic material, which actually is very important, the organic material part, because it slows down how fast the grapes grow. It kind of makes them suffer a little bit so that they, they get a, a, a much bolder flavor. You get a denser grape when it kind of has to suffer. Okay, here's the pictures of the grapes we're gonna taste today. Chardonnay is up on your top right. Then Gerstraminer is down on the bottom right. And you've got 
far left is Chianti, which is actually made from the Sangiovese grape. Chianti is a blend of grapes, and Sangiovese is the dominant grape, and it's also blended with other grapes. And William can talk a little bit more about that. So a lot of times you might have a wine that is not actually named after the grape that it is made out of. So um, labeling can be rather confusing. Labeling is a big marketing scheme. Just be aware of that. The labels are there to make you buy the bottle of wine. <laughs> and then we'll close out with Malbec today. Okay, shall we proceed? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So let me let me open my Chardonnay first of all. William, I'll let you I'll let you take over, and then I'll jump in and talk about Sawyer if you want. Also, if anyone has any questions for Chris, drop it in the chat. Um, and if you had any questions from the lecture, okay. Go ahead, William. Tell me how to drink this. <laughs> so, so the, I want to just give like some, uh, you know, few minutes of, uh, um, of procedures, like, you know, try to understand how we should uh, do this uh, tasting and uh, so, and then in, in some comments like, you know, just think that there are thousands of grapes varieties, 1400 only in Italy. So it's a, it's a very wide world, right? So there are winemaking uh, regions, styles, winemakers, even, you know, several, even several, you know, I did like several years and of studies and 20 and 20 years of involvement with my family in the vineyard. And, and I still feeling that I know so little, like, you know, I don't know nothing, I think. But, uh, but, but it's, a, it's a lifelong pursuit, right? So they're investigating, exploring wines. And, um, and, and I can see also like uh, different uh, uh, techniques. So when, when I was in Berkeley doing my postdoc, I went to Nava, of course. And uh, I saw like in the moon uh, factory, like a robot turning, you know, those bottles periodically. So they, and, you know, the robot was doing all this work, like uh, very precise. And I, I was thinking when I was, kid, when I was kids, like, when I was a kid, like my, my uncle turning my hands, you know, those bottle or the bottle. So it's completely different world. Um, yeah, so let, let's, let's start and uh, take the first one, like a Chardonnay. Uh, I have this Chardonnay here. It's from Italy because I'm in Italy right now. So uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm coming back to US soon because I'm working there. But for the pandemic, I moved here. So these are uh, a Chardonnay and it's, uh, you know, there's a big difference between uh, New World Chardonnays and the uh, old world, like European Chardonnay. So um, you can start to pour your wine in the bottle, in your glass. And you can start doing some, some swill because swill can, can do, um, you know, can give like the oxygen and exchange. You can, I, I really can feel the smell from here, right? So, and, uh, and, and then the second step is like uh, use some of your nose to be there and try to, to smell and see what you think. And the reason why uh, we give some air is because uh, we activate some of the flavors to come to the top. And so we can smell what the wine is like. Uh, then you, you can take a sip and try to pick different flavors. So to do that, you should know all the essences. So like, uh, for example, uh, if you never had, uh, if you ever never smell uh, a rose or thyme or a cloves or a dill, it's really hard to pick up those in the wine, right? So, because, uh, you know, I think it's part of your life that you go outside the world and smell everything you want, like, because it, you can recognize, you know, those smells inside the wine. So, um, I'm waiting a little bit because uh, I want to wait that the wine is, uh, is getting some uh, oxygen. And uh, please, with, especially in the, with, with the white wine, oh, sorry, uh, you have to handle from here because you don't want to put your hands here and then you exchange, you warm up the glass. You have to, especially the white wine, pick up here. It's different from red wine. I will, I will talk about this later. But the white wine, you should be able to you know, stay away as much as possible. I can't pick him from here. I don't know, I'm not really picking on where you wanna, but don't, don't touch the, the glass. That, that's this is the, the main point. So generally European wines, they are mostly earthy. 
they are not as bold uh, they are in the you know in subtle as they are in generally the new world wine so and then i'm thinking like you know US, us australia south america or um, new zealand those big now those are really big words now in uh, in terms of uh, production and uh, uh, because because in europe we really do not use too much like the, the oak barrels we don't change too much the old the, the barrels so and the european wines are kind of earthy with you can see like you can feel like tobacco and leather or some hint of mushroom uh, but the american the other country uh, the wine smell is bold is bigger is fruitier fruiter so they have a lot of uh, essence inside so because this is a, when winemakers have, a, you know, there are a lot of winemakers here in this chat on, the, on this panel, so they can jump in whenever they want. So winemakers have a, like a choice that just after the fermentation, because this is an equation, you have like a juice and sugar plus yeast equal alcohol. So it's an equation. So, but after the fermentation, if uh, from the big jar you get your wine and put in your um, bottle, it's kind of a Polaroid. You get a, like a, a photo. That's it. This is the wine right there. But then, if you age the wine in barrel, and when you age the, in the barrel, especially in the oak barrel, uh, the oak, you know, oak plant to be shaved as a, they need to be warm up, and you know, there is kind of toasting for this wood. Then, this toasting is uh, exchanging a lot of uh, uh, oxygen from outside and it's changing a lot of the characteristics of the wine. This is the main reason why those are so different. Sorry, just because I have to move a little bit. So, um, for, for example, like uh, Chardonnay from Napa has a lot of uh, vanilla flavor, cloves, cinnamon, and uh, nutmeg flavor. Uh, also, the gold has a lot of, is a really gold color. And this is the first step. Like, look at, look at the, the color. So, this is a, I know this wine very well because they produce close by my house. But this wine, it's a, it's a Chardonnay. And, uh, and, you know, I, I really can feel the lemon, like the acidity of, of this. Uh, so if you, if you smell and then you guess. And so I, I already guess here, uh, you know, some lemon, like uh, and something like more with, uh, uh, you know, cloves, maybe. And then, then now it's time to try, right? So, smell, so color, smell, and now see. Yeah, I'm feeling all the lemon here, the acidity around. So, really chardonnay. It's, uh, and, and then this, this drive to another part, like, um, the body of the wine. So the body of the wine is kind of the, the weight of the wine and on your palate, you, 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 palate, you, you can feel like they, if it's heavy or not. Does it feel rich or is it super light uh, almost it's gone immediately after drinking it? See, this is the big difference. So with the red, I would show like later, but even, even there are some um, white wine, but especially the red wine, you can feel like, a, you know, Still feeling after you know 30 seconds the 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 one in your in your mouth. So, but the body of the one generally comes from the alcohol. So you can feel the difference between 11 11 percent alcohol and 15 percent alcohol wine. So, and it's a, this is like a 13 percent. It's a, you know is a for wine white wine is good. It's a good uh, alcohol content, and uh, but it's it's a good way to uh, understand the sorry. Was that sometimes I don't know why it's going to <laughs> stopping. Okay, almost done. Eh? But a bit. We can, see you. We can no? see you. We're good. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, what, what else? Like you know, and, and of course, like as as we, we saw before, like uh, Chardonnay is a, is a green skinned um, um, grape, and uh, the, the production, as I can see, is coming from the Burgundy. Uh, wine region, the eastern part of France, and uh, it's grown like uh, whenever in the in the world, like you know, from US, New Zealand, Europe, and uh, and especially the Chardonnay is also an important ingredient for Champagne and for 
uh, Francia Corte in Italy. So it's a, it's a really famous, like a really important uh, wine. And this is essentially most of the winery, when they start, they start with the Chardonnay. So, so okay, this is a, a very important distinction. Uh, Chardonnay, it's a, if you are in, so it's very sensible to um, weather condition, we'll say like, you know, climate, climate. So um, if uh, uh, you are in a cooler place like uh, uh, Chablis, in uh, the region of Chablis in, in France or in some parts of California, Chardonnay wine to be medium to high body with acidity and flavors of green plume, apple, and pear. But then if you go in a warmer, see a warmer climate like uh, Australia and New Zealand, the flower become more citrus, peach, and the melon, like uh, with the more, uh, with those kind of uh, flavors. But then if you move an even warmer place, you have more tropical. Like, you know, for example, in, uh, in the central, uh, central uh, coast of California. So you have more, you know, this is um, um, important part with the, with the, uh, I would say with the, you know, even sometimes banana mango, you can feel. And, uh, and, and this, but also has a softer acidity. So um, again, let's taste again, because I have like, you know, the, the last part and let's see if I'm gonna move on the biggest terminator. William, I think Chardonnay is your favorite wine. Yeah, for white, yes, for white, yes. So again, I try again because I want to try again. And then I get more citrus notes, sort of like lemon, peel, yellow apples. This wine tastes more acidic and it has much longer tingly finish. You know what I mean, tingly? Yeah, I don't know, yeah. And hangs out enough on my palate. I can feel like uh, the heaviness in the back palate. And uh, from uh, this, this coming from the malolactic fermentation, that makes your wine taste uh, buttery a little bit and well balanced. So yeah, that's it. This is the Chardonnay. Any, you know, write down what, what you feel, what you think, because I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's one of my favorites. Yes, I agree. Put your notes in the chat and I'm gonna read through the um, soil notes that I have regarding Napa specifically. So if you have a Napa shard, this will apply to you. Sonoma, I have a Sonoma shard, so it's a bit different. And then if you are lucky enough to have a European shard, well, there you are. So Napa has a very wide variety of soils and it's because of the really cool geologic history of California. On the right hand side, you can see why Napa is so unique. It is geologically, a valley, go figure. It's between two mountain ranges that were created when the Pacific plate was subducted under the North American continental plate. So here you go, lots of volcanic activity. Um, it really started getting exciting about 9 million years ago when the San Andreas Fault and volcanic activity began to impact the region. I saw someone earlier mention in the chat about a vineyard that is planted on the fault and that is totally wild. I think that's so cool. I need to know the name of it again so I can um, go visit it. So when the Pacific plate was subducting, it forced uplift, which created mountain ranges on either side of the valley. The um, underlying bedrock combined with the volcanics and the deposition off the mountains. So rainfall comes, you get erosion, blah, blah, blah. And then on either side, um, it created a super diverse soil situation in Napa. So there's over a hundred variations. There's 33 soil series. I think Fran, we actually have more soil series in Texas, but correct me if I'm wrong in the chat. And then in Napa, because you have this really, um, there's such a push for push for land there. If you've ever been up there, it is crazy. It's, it's crazy how expensive land is. So they buy every square foot. The valley floor soils tend to be deeper and more fertile, obviously, because gravity and they produce vigorous growth. So you have to actually go in and crop and, and, and pick out from the crop. Like you have to thin the vines, otherwise they will overgrow and you will get a very poor crop of grapes. So you have to have a very keen eye for pruning your grape vines. They have to be very tightly managed and they produce concentrated grapes. But on the hillsides, which is the picture on the bottom left of the screen, the vine has to struggle. So earlier I said in Mendoza, you want your vines to like just, you want them to fight for every, for everything, for every drop. 
you don't want them to, to like be near death, but you want them to, to really fight for it. And if they struggle to survive on the spare rocky soils, they produce smaller grapes, which are highly concentrated and full of flavor. So these will actually produce completely different wines. So you could have two wines from Napa, one's a valley wine, one's a hillside wine, and they will be drastically different. And it's just, it's, it's a very, very dynamic thing growing grapes. I think it's so cool because as a scientist, it integrates all the sciences. It is, I just think it's fantastic. All right. Question so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a, have us all take a pause. And since you were talking about growing grapes, I'm going to ask a question if that's okay. And this one is um, meant to go to Fran, but I also feel like all the other panelists could potentially answer. And um, uh, sorry, we've sort of touched on some of these, but what would be, you know, we've, we've talked on and off about what I would do to grow grapes, what I would do to grow grapes, but like step number one, we, we've talked about a lot of the details, but I am just someone sitting here watching this drinking wine. I need just, what's step number one? What, what is the very first thing I would want to consider when thinking about growing grapes for wine? Um, I do <laughs> You want us to answer by voice or chat? Oh, voice. I would like to, I, I want to hear you guys talk. Well, I would say, check the weather that's what's the weather type in, in your environment and and that's what i would say first some places just no matter how good the the soil is if the the climate um i mean we have it here it's rough so yeah um check the check the weather all right weather obviously soil drainage <laughs> drainage Soil drainage weather. Tiffany, any comments to add there? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, we, we, like I said, our, I think we have a very slow. Can you hear me better, by the way? Try talking slowly. Okay. I think that might be. I think you think your your speaker's having issues picking up what it calls background noise versus your voice. Oh, okay. Um, well, I agree with what the ladies have said. Um, we are in a very challenging environment, our vineyard specifically. Um, so yeah, soil type, drainage is something we don't have. We actually have to pump out water of our vineyard so that we can <laughs> not always be in a, in a puddle. <laughs> um, so yeah, those are the most important things to think about for sure. And your soil test, and you have to do them every year also to keep up with that, what you need in your vineyard. Soil tests every year around the same time of the year. Keep track of all the fertilizers you're putting down, if any. And we had the same problem as Tiffany did at her vineyard. My husband had to get in with a backhoe, pull out some clay, and put down gravel and rock so that we could improve the drainage. So you can improve the drainage, but it's a lot of labor. You have to, you would, you literally would have to replace the soil that's there so that you can you can improve drainage. So. Um, so yeah, so if none of those are problems for you, if you're in a warm enough climate, obviously Tiff, um, Tiffany grew grapes in Idaho. She's made wine in Idaho before. So it just, it really just depends. The, the, it's the classic geologic answer. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good answer. Um, so I would say we might want to switch to the Gewurz Traminer. Yeah. We, uh, we, um, just to make sure everybody's, this is a laid back event, so I'm gonna talk about the agenda to everybody. We are currently 10 minutes behind. So not so bad for a group of geologists, actually. I, I'm proud. Especially and, drinking, oh. especially geologists drinking. I mean, I could have talked way more about the community. <laughs> and I actually misspoke. We're not 10 minutes behind. We're like more like 15 to 20. Um, so. Let's talk about Converge Demeanor, and then after we do that, we'll talk about what we want to do for our little networking intermission. How's that sound, everyone? Is anyone going to another meeting after this? Good question, Gretchen. <laughs> we I'm can here. all... I'm here. I'm here all night. <laughs> Thank 
Thank you. And any other good questions in there? You know, there's a lot going on in the chat. So if you have a question, I would suggest making sure you include a question mark, maybe like five, because then I'll make sure to, to bring the question up. And I love that there's so much going on in the chat, guys. Keep the engagement up. Okay, now I'm passing it back to you, William. Tell me about German wine. Yeah, so actually really, really uh, connected with the, the thematic we were talking about, like, you know, the climate. So Gewustraminer, so a German, German wine. So Gewustraminer in, Ge in German this is formed by two words, like Gewurz, which, uh, which means spices. Uh, you know, thinking about cloves or nutmeg and cinnamon, very uh, strong uh, spices. And the uh, Traminer, which means uh, it's, a, it's a region in the, in the lower part of, uh, between like Italy and, uh, and uh, Austria. So, but it's also like, you know, the, you know, it's also the southern part of, of, of um, uh, Germany and, uh, and France. So this, all those areas are really important for the Gewurztraminer historically. And now it's also, you know, it's also very, really, it's doing like a very good results also in US, in Oregon, Washington state. Uh, those are like the most, uh, most uh, famous one. Um, but, but, but this wine love, uh, big excursion between like not night and day. So like, uh, you know, these are like uh, cold nights and uh, like, you know, probably, probably like high upland valleys. You know, those are like a good environment for, for this wine. And the color, okay, let's, let's do like some tasting. So all, all white wine, I like, I like them like cold. So I will, I will leave them in the refrigerator and take out, you know, just when you want to drink them. So the color is golden and, and the other with the copper, copper tones, you can see it's not like a crystal yellow as the Chardonnay. This one, you can see like it's kind of, it's a little thing like orange, but copper, like copper. And uh, this is mostly because of the, the color of the skin, right? So it's not, it's not like a green skin. So it's a, it's a pink skin. So there is some exchange of color between the skin and the, actually all the wines are white then the skin is giving the color, right? So the red, the red wine is because it's not like the, the juice of the grapes is red, it's always white. Then the skin is giving the color. And this, this happened also in this one because the, the grapes are, um, Chris showed before in the, in the slides, those are like um, pinky skin uh, um, grapes. Uh, yeah, and the, and the color is pretty gold also um, some uh, copper tone. Uh, okay, let, let's smell it. Wow, this is completely different, right? From Chardonnay, it's completely different. It's it's another world. So this this is a, this is an aromatic wine. So this this aromatic. You, you can you can feel like uh, the you know the flowers or uh, you know, kind of, so bouquet of, of lychees. Did you know lychees? Yeah, this Korean fruit, like, uh, um, you know, these are, these are aroma of roses, like they, they, there, is a, there is a floral here. So Gewurztraminer is completely different from Chardonnay. They have like a really big, big change. And yeah, so let, let's, uh, let, let's get a sip now. Move around, move around in your mouth. It's, it's it, 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 you know, it's good too. <laughs> it's great. Like I cannot see like Chardonnay is my best, but this one is, is really good. So it's um, you, you you can you can smell, you can feel even like in your mouth, cloves. You can, you can feel also like some clementine notes, right? Something like uh, or like uh, peaches, like apricots, something like uh. I don't know. Yeah, I, I can feel it. I don't know if you can feel it, but it's a uh, it's 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 a very dy dynamic and, and uh, it's defined as a feminine uh, um, wine because it's, because all the presence of these flowers inside. But but at the end, at the end of this wine, I, I get another sip. Wow. So at the very end of this wine, I can feel like a, 
brown pier or you know on the palate okay can you feel it at the end uh, i don't know something like yeah so i don't want to add too much about because it, the chardonnay of course is one of my favorite but also i had a lot of description before so i think i'm done with the gusto minor but you know i think the floreal and the lychee tasty i do you know lychee like this it's fruit from korea this uh, uh south asia it's um you really can feel this like in, in this kind of wine. And, William, uh, is it weird asking questions to a bunch of people looking at you and you can't hear any of us? Right, I'm sorry. <laughs> or are you, are you used to it being a professor during COVID? <laughs> yes, right now it's like, uh, yeah, I'm used to like, yeah. I would love to, to, to you know, what, what do you feel? What do you feel? What, what do you think? <laughs> you know, all, all, all of those, uh, apricots, peaches, or lychees, or what, what, what's, what's, what do you feel, you know, smelling and tasting? This, this, this is the big question, like, you know, the color, smell, and the taste, like, you know, this, this, everyone has particular sensors, so. Well, I know you um, probably can't keep up because you're, you know, lecturing, but there is a lot of answers in the chat. People are answering you. We're just okay. quiet, vo vocally. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can see like a ninety-eight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. I, I, I will take a look now. Okay. Okay. Apricot. Good. I want to feel the apricot inside. Yeah. Yeah, I got lucky. Yeah, I'm in Italy because yeah, actually this one is just on the boundary between Germany, like Austria. In Italy, it's uh, but I think in US, California is hard, but you know, Oregon and Washington State they are doing a really good job right now in uh, with the good So, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry, I, I am trying to keep up with the chat and moderate at the same time while drinking wine. So, this has really been a challenge in my multitasking skills. Um, you need to add that to your resume. <laughs> this is serious. This is serious multitasking. Uh, I, also, I know no one can see it, but I also have a lot of private conversations going on in the chat. And one of them was with Chris. So you know what? I'm just going to talk to Chris in front of everybody. Chris, what do you want to? What do we want to do next? So everyone, I would, I would like to take a vote. If okay. anyone is interested in continuing the wine tasting and moving the networking social to the end, are we in favor of that? Just write Y or N in the chat because we can continue the wine tasting for people that actually need to get off the call because I know in the East Coast in Europe, it's rather late. So we need to let William go because he's in Rome. So if we can continue. Yeah, okay. We're going to do the wine. We're going to switch to reds. Everyone, please have, a, <laughs> please have a sip of water. Please have some bread. Because if you go from a Gerstraminer to a Chianti, it's gonna be rough. It's gonna be rough. I'm just telling you right now, it's not gonna be fun. <laughs> You're not gonna be like, oh, this is the best Chianti I've ever had. You're gonna be like, this is terrible. It's like brushing your teeth in orange juice. Like you have to cleanse your palate. So I am going to share my screen again. We're gonna relook at the grapes, and then I'm gonna talk to you about Tuscany for a couple minutes. So. Can you use a bio break? Go do a bio break, go grab a glass of water. Um, you've seen these grapes already. And then William, we're gonna get started with, I think Chianti's the next one. Woohoo! Yay. And then I will stay on for the networking event. Um, I know William will, will probably go to bed because he's in Rome. So it's like, you know, it's already- I don't know. It's already if tomorrow know, there. It's already tomorrow. <laughs> If I know okay. William, which I do, he might have some energy. <laughs> no pressure, Willie. <laughs> so we're going to move on. The grape that we're going to taste next is in the bottom left hand corner. So Chianti is a blended grape. Benjavese is the primary component, but um, there are a lot of legal, uh, William can talk to this actually, the laws in, in other, in France and Italy and Spain specifically. So I would like to give another wine talk, but I want to give it about like Spain specifically because of the geologic history and um, just talk about Spanish wines and everyone can drink Rioja and Tempranillo. So that might be the next one. But um, 
Sinjuvese is is a really complex, beautiful grape. I actually Sinjuvese is actually my favorite wine, like straight Sinjuvese. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you guys about. We're skipping that, but definitely get bread, crackers, water, and go to the restroom. Those are those are really important. We're gonna go to Chianti. Tuscan soils are so cool. They are beautiful. If you haven't been to Tuscany, I highly recommend it. It's so fantastic. So they also have a really diverse soil profile, which is really interesting. And that's why you might have a Chianti that you love and then have another Chianti and hate it, which is, which is what has happened to me multiple times <laughs> because the climate is different in these different regions. So there's different components and different winemakers. There's so many factors. Um, there's a lot of friable marl with limestone and sandstone. So you are getting that limestone component. Again, limestone is just, is just really, really important a lot of times for um, solid vineyard production. On the upper right-hand corner, you can see that's like my dream vacation slash retirement home, which will never happen, right? Um, Multipucciano has sand with heavy clay soils and clay is a, it's a, it's a fraction, right? When you think of clay, you have to think of an actual grain size fraction. Don't think of red clay. Don't think of just lime marl. Clay is, clay is a size fraction. So it, it's, you have to differentiate where the provenance is, what the source rock is. So, um, and then there's also regions in Tuscany that have sandy soils and then um, they're, often overlying compacted clay. So it's really tough for the roots to get down deep. If there's compacted clay, the roots have a really hard time getting down when it's dry. So if you've ever been to Tuscany, you know it's hot and it's dry. There's some really awesome local soil names that you might wanna learn if you're ever there. And I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce them, but I will let William say them. So there's friable marl with layered limestone. They're hard gray blue sandstone. There is compact clay and limestone, which is in the South Central zone. Again, that clay is mostly lime clay. Think of, when you think of clay in a wine sense, you're generally gonna think of a marl. You're not gonna think of where we are, uh, where I am specifically in Texas, where you have like red clay. That is not normal. You normally think of like a marl, like a lime clay. And then there's a calcareous tufa, which is all throughout the South of Tuscany. Tuscany is a really large, region geographically so all right William I'm going to hand back over to you to talk to us about Chianti. Thank you Grace. So um, Chianti uh, yeah I I would say you know red wines really they they, they are strong and, and they, they are violent so they really you know Chianti is one of them. Chianti is one of them. So it's a um, here are two bottle. This is a uh, this is the one that I'm gonna sorry because my hands is different from okay the screen. So this is the one I opened before and uh, I, I left open a little bit because you know the red one really need the oxygenation and uh, to open better and uh, this are, but also I like this other candy here with uh, this are really you know with uh, Leonardo da Vinci it's. One of my favorites, like uh, Pricely and also quality, it's really good. And this is, is Italian one, of course. And, and but these are different, these are different. So the, the, the difference is this is a black rooster here. So the black rooster is really an index of uh, quality and there's a Chianti Classico. It's uh, the really old one. Is this a rooster there or no? Uh, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. So the, the rooster is really important to give you like, uh, an idea of uh, area where the um, is productive the the county. So uh, I will pour this one because it's, uh, it's better. So I really see the color. Like uh, if you are drinking like Merlot, Shiraz, other Amarone, this kind of a very strong red wine. You can see like a brilliant color. And we we'll, so we we'll see later with the, the um, Malbec. So Chianti, it's a, the hearth of Chianti region lies in, uh, in Toscany, in the hills between Florence and Siena. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a protected origin. So it's a, a DOCG uh, wine. And, um, and the Chianti Classico, it's really important. It's a, 
There are also other parts with the, the Chianti Ufina or other Chianti in their region, but uh, the, by law, the Chianti has to be 80% of the grapes coming from Sangiovese. So these are really by law, so we cannot produce Chianti without 80% of Sangiovese. Um, yeah, and uh, some Chianti is uh, robust enough, they can be aged uh, for decades, developing a more complex uh, taste and, and flavor. And uh, Chianti generally has a medium body wine and tastes like cherries, black tea, we will see now, and has a, uh, but it has a lot of tannins. The tannins uh, is the, the taste that, you know, dry your mouth out. So, and, uh, and also, but also has a acidity. So it's a tannins and acidity. It's a, a complex uh, marriage between those two portion of the, the mouth. So when you will try this wine, you can feel like a conflict in your mouth. So it's uh, some other wines, uh, for example, flop with the, uh, if you drink uh, and eat like a, a stick and, uh, uh, or tomatoes as it food, but this wine, this wheat with, with everything, like, you know, with the very fat uh, stick and, you know, with the fat, like a Fiorentina, like, a, you know, I think it's four or five centimeters high. This this wind and a lot of fat. This wind because there's a lot of uh, um, tannins and the acidity. They can you know be very well coupled with this kind of food um, because the Chianti will only improve the food and the, the wine. So if you smell, if you smell, so the the, the color is kind of uh, it's kind of uh, it's not. It looks like you know if you if you I have like white pepper here. If you put on white pepper, you can see that it's not really completely red. Looks like kind of a dark orange. And when you smell, you can feel like, you know, cherries or, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, I would say like, like more mushrooms also, like, you know, something like uh, uh, dry, something. Yeah, but but I, I'm waiting for the big bump in my mouth. So it's uh, let, let's take a seat. Wow, ah. I can feel my mouth like you know the lateral part, the acid part. It's devastated. And you know, and also like uh, on the back part, a lot of uh, tannins, like uh, really chewing, uh, chewing the wine, like you can feel. And you know, you can also feel the heaviness of this wine because it's still in your mouth. Like, you know, it's gonna be here now all night long because it's, uh, cherries for sure. Yeah, and the finish, like, you know, really black tea, something really kind of bitter, like, uh, yeah, I'm interacting with myself, but, you know, this is how I feel. So if you want to say something, like, just write in the chat. So, <laughs> There's lots of interaction going on in the chat. We're yeah, interacting with you. You just can't hear us. <laughs> I'm getting yeah. a lot of tannin, definitely some dark fruits. It's really, it's, it's pretty... Actually, let's just take a quick second. Hey, everyone, like, unmute yourself. Tell us what you're tasting. If you're comfortable with it, go for it. Someone other than me and Chris is willing to unmute themselves and tell us what they're tasting. Very heavy on the cherries. Yeah, there we go. Um, uh, Tiffany, do you want to talk about glassware with me? Or would you like to start with glassware? And like I, can start. I actually did switch glasses. I had a, I had a different wine glass for my white wine versus my red wine. So this is there's a lot of reasons for this. It's like yeah. the um, like like William mentioned, the, the trips. red and white are are very different. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, would you like to speak? To that? Um, yes, and I'll remember to speak slowly. <laughs> um, but it is important for the red wine to open up, um, as William said, and allow for oxygenation, um, that will allow for it to be maybe less intense, um, on a, a less of an explosion on the palate, um, creating more softer notes coming out. And so uh, that wide rim glass um, that Chris held up um, 
is is what you know you can actually like move it around and get that solid aeration act and have a beautiful crisp as well. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Thank you. So luckily these days, it's very easy to order appropriate wine glasses online or buy them at Home Goods or at Bed Bath & Beyond. So your favorite retailer is very happy to sell you wine glasses sold in a set. So you can order uh, white wine and red wine glasses. And then champagne, obviously, everyone recognizes the champagne glass and it's far a sparkling wine glass. So um, let's see, I don't remember. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you can like honestly, you can swing by home goods. Oh, sorry, you can swing by home goods a Tuesday morning and, and get yourself a couple sets of glasses for for ten bucks. And then when your friends come over, you'll be like, oh yes, this is my red wine glasses and my white wine glasses, and you can just post the most fabulous things. All right, let's see what other questions there are in there. Yeah, my dog, my dog was really upset about. Plastic, but yeah, okay. I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> okay, I think we're caught up. So you had some... earlier what we were all drinking? Yes, please tell us. So we have a, I don't know how to say this, but it it's, looks like Braganini Reserve. It's a 2004 Merlot. We picked it up. A number of years ago in Michigan. And on the label, it says Italian roots, Michigan soil. Wow. Does it tell I don't you know. back what the actual, what, it, so what's the, it's like, it's literally a Chianti they grew in Michigan? A Merlot. Oh, you have a, oh, you have a Merlot. Oh, wow. ooh, ooh. So you're getting a lot of stone fruit maybe in your Merlot. I'm sorry. We can do, a, we'll do another lecture. I think this is going to end up being a series of lectures. So I'm going to take- We have talked about that already. You <laughs> guys, you guys did an outstanding thing here. This is, I'm impressed and I would be all in for more of these. Um, this is probably coming across under my wife's name, Mary. This is Todd. <laughs> <laughs> in any event. She, she was able to log in. I wasn't able to log in correctly. So there's two of us on this. Uh, but you guys did something really great here. So if you want to do this again and do one for beer, I'm all in. Thank you. This is really hard to do virtually, to be quite honest with you, especially switching back and forth between presenters. But I would like to, we would like to do a series of them and I'll do one that focuses on Spain and one that focuses on Australia. And then we can do one that's like specific to California because the geologic histories of all regions are so different. And then one for Italy, but you're gonna, you have a tougher time getting the wines because we'll have to order very specific wines. But yes, thank you. I'm glad, okay, good. I'm in, we'll, we'll do this multiple times a year. And then at some point we can do a face-to-face -face one when everybody's, when everybody's ready. Maybe we can do it at the AAPG conference in Denver. You guys all join the Women's Network and AWG, which I am the, I'm, I'm on the committee for AWG too, so selfless plug there for all the, for all the supporting organizations. Good plug. Okay, yeah. I know it's really fun. <laughs> I just saw Ooh. in the chat there's a suggestion for the geology of coffee. Why had I not thought of that? That's a really good idea when you do that one in the morning though, like on a Saturday. I think I think that was that Amy, right now, yeah. Really rough. <laughs> um sorry, I I'm enjoying the discussion and I also feel um, as moderator that I'm a little bit slacking on my telling us to keep on track because I, uh, and I only say that because there is, um, I mean, we're still enjoying our, our wine tasting and we're, we're doing our networking and I love that um, before people all start leaving, if you have to leave, there is like one more little surprise that we wanna do at the end. So don't leave yet, hold tight. And by when I say at the end, I realize now that the people involved in that are, it is very late where they live. And so let's, um, let's defer to both William and Andrea, who is on the call, who, who um, I think it's about 
midnight almost they're there so so this is me awkwardly saying i'm enjoying this networking let's put it on pause and make sure we give everybody who needs to probably go to bed on the sooner side uh, the floor again thank you everyone we'll switch to malbec really quick well have everyone have a you know what while we're in the transition zone between a chianti and a malbec please have a cracker or a snack or a drink of water and this we're going to come back to this slide but um for now let's go ahead and look at all the submissions we had all the participants were asked to submit their favorite wines, where the wine is from, what the vineyard name is. So we have one from Dan. Dan, thank you so much for submitting this. Um, here's a before, before we jump into it, can I quickly give credit mm -hmm. to Andrea for putting this yes. together? Thank you, Andrea. For putting this Andrea, together. are you, are you, I know it's really late at your time, but are you interested in turning your camera on and saying hi? And if not, that's fine. If you're in your pajamas, that's cool too. <laughs> But thank you, Andrea Lopez, for putting this together. She is part of the APG Women's Network leadership team. Okay, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, here we go, a Pinot Noir from Oregon. Oregon is a fantastic place for Pinot Noir. My favorite year is probably 2017. So we can talk about, uh, we can do a whole session on Pinot Noir if anybody wants to, because it is a very famous and versatile grape. Did you know, I think Pinot Grigio and Pinot Noir are actually the same grape, just with and without the skins. Fun facts. All right, Terry sent us this really nice Ontario uh, winery here, Viewpoint in Essex County. And here's another one, Bakersfield in Houston, Dover Canyon Winery. Tanya. So Napa, which we were just talking about earlier, Stag's Leap, that is a super famous wine, actually. I've seen it in multiple wine competitions. Elena, again, with her awesome <laughs> Order Vision Schiff's winery, which we all need to take a vacation to. This is definitely a field trip location. If we can like coordinate some kind of field trip to go see these Cambrian and Order Vision Schiff's in the trilobites and go have some wine. If anybody wants to spearhead this effort to plan this field trip, I'm in, I'm already ready. I've had my airline miles, you know, building up this past year, let's do it. All right, Leanne in Chile. Oh, this looks fantastic. We could also do a field trip to Chile. We need the local chapters of uh, AAPG Women's Network to guide us on these, these trips. I think that would be extremely appropriate. So if you're willing, just send an email to Rebecca, please. She's our, our chair for these, uh, these social networking events. From Dave Mendoza, we're getting there. If Dave, if you're on the call and you want to jump in at any moment and talk about your Mendoza experience, that would be really awesome. Also um, good geologically yeah. awesome. We'll we'll get to we'll get there in just a second. And um, when we talk about the Malbec, yeah. And Andrea, she's the one that actually generated the PowerPoint slide. So this is in Bolivia, in Santa Cruz. And you can see they've got nets on the, on the grapes on the bottom right, and that's to protect them from birds. Birds, birds are our number one. Birds are just, the birds like the grapes, I'm gonna tell you right now. All right, and Rochelle, South Australia. Australia has some fantastic wines. In multiple regions. I'm going to go ahead and pass back so that we can go ahead and move to the Mendoza region. So Dan, thank you for submitting Mendoza. William, do you want to take over? Yes, I was try to uh, answer, you know, the, all the different questions like. Uh, that's you know I don't want to annoy everyone. So I said some, something like privately, something like more for everyone. So it's uh, yeah, I, I'm glad that people are enjoying this. This part it's, it's, it's good. So okay, was so for me it was in, in Italy in Rome was so hard to find a Malbec, but the end I found it like from Argentina, Passo Doble. It's a uh, 
85% uh, Malbec and 15% Corvina. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's always like 85% Malbec. So, and there is, you know, the Malbec is, a, um, in Mendoza has about like, you know, 75%, I, I did some research on the Malbec because I'm not really familiar with Malbec. But uh, I really enjoy to, I drink another bottle before this, like before this one. No, no not today, another day. So, but um, however, uh, Malbec actually originated from France. But you know, in the, but there is a huge production in Argentina, like 75% of worldwide production is in Argentina, in Mendoza. So it's, um, so the, let, let's try it, okay. So it's, you know, I, I really say that, you know, the color is completely, I can see, you know, right now. So I have this other one and this one, oh my gosh, look. This, this one is all, you know, uh, you, you need a white paper to look at the color. So it's here, this, this is like a, a ruby, ruby color, right? It's more, uh, um, I would say like more purple one. It's a purple one. It's, it's a, you know, it's different from, Canty has this kind of, uh, uh, you know, orangish color. It's not like a so red like this one. This one is super red. And um, and also, you know, there is another way to check also the the um, the body, also the hardcore content of the wine. It's uh, so it, it's uh, the legs. They call the legs. Or in Italian, it's like a, it's arco. It's arches. So when you turn a little bit your glass and then you do this kind of you can see arches forming so on top. So when you see these arches on top, it's important how they disappear. If you turn here, sometimes they go very fast. So it's, that, that means that the alcohol, there's a low content of alcohol. Of alcohol. If a, the, the arches on top stay uh, stable, that means it's a very high content of alcohol. You know, high, I mean like, you know, between 11% and 15%. Uh, percent. So it's not like a very crazy. But so, so put on the angle and then turn your glass and that puts, and you can see arches forming. I, 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 I learned that in, in English is like a legs. So because I did all my training as a sommelier in Italian. So I, I also spent like, you know, a few days to learn all those different, it's called in, in English like, in English or sommelier, it's like legs, so it's different. I want to back that up, everybody. Many of my conversations with William were, oh, I have to learn the English words for all of this. I have to <laughs> learn the English words. I trained in Italian. No one will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's like, it's okay. He put a lot of work into learning the English words. So thank you, William. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I really, I enjoy it because I, you know, now uh, I'm in Italy right now, but I'm going to be back in the US. I'm going to stay there a lot. So I want to be able to chat with friends about wine because it's really, uh, it's my passion. So I really like it. So let's let's take a smell now. Like take a, you don't know the brief really deeply. And then, you know, what do you feel? I, I, I can say what I feel like, you know, I feel like berries, like raspberries or blackberries. It's a little bit different. The other one was like really cherry. This one is like a berries. I can, I can feel like some difference in the... Yeah, definitely is different, yeah. I, I think uh, the, the bottle I tried before was like shocking. I think this one is gonna shock me again. Like, Yeah, surprise, I can find a surprise here today. So it's, it's chocolate. I can feel chocolate at the end. Even some pepper. So it's, uh, there, are, there are notes of peppers, I think, like, uh, but it's, uh, it's chocolate. I, and, and you know, there are, there are a lot of tannins here. The, the tannins is coming from the, I, I think I, I, say, I said before, like from the, the skin of the grape, right? So the, also giving the color, but also giving the like, uh, because uh, uh, the skin of the, of the uh, grape has like a different uh, 
thickness. So if it's very thick can give like a lot of tannins to the, the wine. So at least like generally, generally. No, no, not all the grapes are the same, uh, behaving in the same way. Yeah, but it's like a notes of, uh, yeah, I feel like uh, even cherries, but mostly like blackberries and raspberries. And then this hand like, you know, chocolate, like a boom, at the end, boom, chocolate, it's crazy. So good, like, I really, I, you know, I discovered this, I, I, I tried before because I, I went in a conference in Buenos Aires like two years ago. I tried there, but um, I think the, well, this is a really good bottle because I cannot find like any cheap bottle. I, I spent 20 euros for this bottle. So I think it's gonna be good. It's 2014. It's like- a, That's a lot years. of money. Oh man, thank you, William. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. I'm gonna buy you dinner when you come my back. My pleasure, my pleasure. It's really, you know- Are you at least I, sharing it with Julia? Yeah, sure. She's here. She's just on the back of the screen, <laughs> drinking with me. She's there. Okay, good. Sign up. So she's drinking with me. I'm passing okay, like under the, table, under the table the glasses. She's drinking on the other side. So yeah, yeah, it's that. Uh, yeah, and then and then you know the. I think uh, I think uh, you know we. We we choose we, we choose a really good wine. So definitely, like you know, it's a very big variety of wines. It was a hard hard choices. But we, I think we, we choose something that it's, uh, you know, even even the, there are a lot of, uh, uh, I would say not, not competition, but kind of, uh, 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 up and low, like uh, on different uh, level of, uh, you know, the Chianti has like different colors, different uh, uh, smell and, and taste for, you know, it's more, it's, I, I would say you can feel the, it's probably like it's more like a, uh, because I, because I went there so many times and it's uh, I'm feeling like a, I'm feeling really the ancient the, the ancestry of this wine like uh, this one is, looks as new but it's a but it's great it's a great wine I really like it so it's a uh, but you know the, the Cant is really making me feeling like a, uh, you know a long tradition on producing wine like you know centuries of wine or winery there. So this one probably like Argentina is not producing like uh, like uh, the Chianti region uh, in, the, in the left long span, I would say like in the, in the, in the long, uh, um, in the time. So, but it's, uh, but that is, the, the, this product has, is, is promising and it's, it's great. And, uh, and, and I think it's, it's completely different from the, the, Fr the French one that I tried before. Because the French one, again, is very healthy. It's, uh, um, has more like a leather inside. This one is it's kind of fresh, but it's also, um, it, it's rich. It's a rich and has a lot of bodies. This, this, this wine has a lot of body. I can feel the body here. So, and even like, you know, it's 14% alcohol. It's, uh, you know, for red is a good, uh, is a good uh, percentage. So yeah, please. Uh, so I want to say in the chat, somebody asked, um, William, are you saying you can taste history? I think it's more like in my mind. <laughs> I think it's more like in my mind. It's like, uh, yeah, I cannot, I cannot feel this, but I don't know. I, you can taste it on a deeper level. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, a kind of a trance, you know, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's a, I'm dreaming, like, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, these people like they're, you know, picking, you know, going with the, with the horses and then, you know, pressing the wine, like, you know, by, by with, the, with the foots, with the feet. So it's, a, it's, it's, I don't know, it's something like, uh, yeah, because I went there and the, most, uh, and, you know, there's also like a bridge in, uh, in New York called the Berrazzano Bridge, if someone knows New York. So Berrazzano was a soldier, medieval soldier, it's a name, from someone like, and there's a castle in the, in the Montepulciano area, close by the Chianti. And, uh, you know, they produce for, I went in this uh, winery, it's from 16th century. So they produce wine 16th century, like, you know, four, four centuries of wine. So you go there and you feel like the history there. So, I don't know, it's, uh, yeah. It's a, you, you know, 
I think like wine is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a travel on yourself. You do, you know, you do, and then you, you, you want to know more, more, more. You have to be angry on knowledge for wine because wine, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a travel. Like, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's a journey. It's a journey. It's a journey. You have to get like this journey. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a journey that never ends because you, you want to try everything. You know, if I'm going in some place, so I went to the, this uh, conference in Buenos Aires and I went to Uruguay because I want to try also the one from Uruguay. I went to Chile and I went to, from the north to the south and I stopped by and trying, you know, Casillero del Toro or other uh, very famous cantina because I want to try that. So it's anyway, I'm sorry. It's, it's a good one. William, somebody commented in the chat that your passion is contagious. So don't, do not apologize for having amazing passion. That yeah. is one of the most inspiring traits in a person. I would say I am a geologist because I had passionate professors. And so now I guess I'll become more of a wine drinker because you're passionate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I agree. Good job. I'm so excited. I'm so excited that everyone is very happy about the event. We were we were thinking it would be difficult to do a wine tasting virtually. And then no one likes endless PowerPoint packs. So we really wanted to break it up. But um the the sediment in the um Mendoza region is is crazy. You would I well, I would never think that you would grow um, such good, good grapevines in it, but it's it's so alluvial and it's such a it's such a future conglomerate. It's a conglomerate waiting to happen, basically, and it's so dry. And this is what I mentioned earlier, where you force the vines to grow those deep roots. You make them suffer mm -hmm. like just enough so that they have to like push to to get water you don't want I mean, you don't want to kill them but like they're beautiful grapes you can see in the bottom right hand picture you can actually see the grapes and they hang they hang low on the vines and the unique thing compared to other regions that grow Malbecs is the altitude in Mendoza like how high it is it's a high desert which is super cool very mountainous terrain excellent drainage you know when you have steep slopes the drainage is fantastic Fran and Tiffany both mentioned that drainage is a killer. It's been a killer for us. If your roots sit in soggy water, it's it's terrible for them. And the first Molbeck wines were imported from Bordeaux, as William mentioned, uh, and they're planted in Mendoza in 1860. But I think William, when did Mendoza when did Mendoza become such a like prominent region? Because Malbec is just more recently in America and the U.S. become like such a big deal. Like first, like Cabernet was a big deal down there. And Somebody then, in the chat mentioned the 70s. I'm trying to remember who. Oh, it was you, Chris. It was me, I, was asking. I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm a panelist and that's what the best question. Sorry, I Chris. Think, oh. I, I think it was like 30, well, oh man, no, 50 years ago. Oh, I'm so old. So <laughs> the 70s. I think William, since you can taste history, can you do you know do you happen to know what the history of Moldova? It's because you no, know, it's mostly because I'm a geomorphologist. Oh. William, you're oh, muted. Sorry, I don't William. know why. Sorry, William, unmute real quick. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I was saying that you know I'm a, I'm a geomorphologist, so I'm looking for time scales anyway. So like I'm projecting my you know, landscape evolution in the future, but I can go back and see what's happening in the last 20, 30 years. Yeah, I don't know, but it's, uh, yeah. You know, I, I would say that wines from Argentina, they're really uh, in the last uh, couple of decades, they are gonna be, yeah. they, they, they've been like very successful. They are, you know, they, and then they face like a big crisis, they bump down the price, but they, they had, you know, the product is, is amazing. It's, uh, I think that they want so many prices in the past, and I think you know, 1970s, 1980s was like the, the time they um, I can find like a more uh, historical uh, literature on, on on those places. Those uh, I investigated a little bit more back more. So we have another question from the chat. Actually, we have a couple questions. Um, actually, we have a question from Amy. 
Amy, do you want to turn your microphone on and ask your question? And you don't have to if you've got loud, loud noise going on in the background, but I want to encourage participants to go ahead and ask their questions if they want. Uh, sure. I just, uh, I'm coming at this from the perspective of a bedrock geologist who doesn't deal with soils a whole lot. And I'm just wondering what the depth to bedrock is at these various wineries, like are the roots ever in bedrock directly or is it always soil or is it like quaternary unconsolidated sediments or does it, I, I don't know, do the roots like need to be in sediment or can it be um, like actual hard bedrock? The first, the first two feet, 20, the first 24 inches need to be actual soil for the most part. And that is because that's where the nutrients come from. The bedrock itself, the, the transmission of minerals from the bedrock is so slow that the roots can't get it in enough time to metabolize it for um, photosynthesis. So as long as the first, I would even say 18 inches, Fran, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think as long as the first 18 inches are soil, the roots will be okay because it is the multivitamin source. If there's bedrock under that, that's really key for water. So in the Champagne region, and I think maybe the Chablis region of France, the roots actually do get down to the bedrock where it's uplifted. If you will, I didn't want to add more slides about the structural history of France and the, the Paris region specifically. There's a lot of uplift and um, erosion. If you look into it, there's a lot of vineyards where the vines actually do go into fractured bedrock. And if the bedrock is fractured, that helps with irrigation and drainage and the vines actually will go into the bedrock. Uh, the roots of the vines will go into the bedrock for water access, but um, it's the top 18 to 24 inches are key for mineral absorption for the root systems. Fran, do you have anything you wanna add? Um, well, gotcha. sometimes there Thank will you. be a, a nutrient deficiency that um, the grower can take care of um, by adding compost or some sort of soil on top. Um, but yeah, uh, I, Chris, that's right. Yep. Um, like Thanks, May everyone. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, there's a, like a follow-up question in the chat asking about the relationship between water table and landscape uh, rather than just bedrock position. Uh, so, so, so landscape position, I think meaning, I think relating to potentially longer term precipitation rates, for example, or uh, not just the depth to bedrock, but also probably, I think the water input. Um, I might be interpreting that incorrectly. Rainfall's a big issue. So um, depending on, like, obviously you can't grow Good, good wines in Cairo, you know, like, so, so rainfall is, is still, like we mentioned earlier, the actual climate and the precipitation value is a really important number. So, um, water table. so your water table is going to depend on your rate of precipitation and also like other, other things. Too. So like, I don't know, it's interesting because here our water, like our water well is, is like 70 feet deep. So it's, it, but the vines do fine. And so it's just, I mean, it's, I think it just depends on the region. That's a, that's a good question though. I need to do some more research on that. Well, Thank you. Um, I can say for one thing, usually people land with landscape, they water more than you would a grape. So that that's where the problem might lie is you would end up overwatering your, your vines and that would interfere with the quality um, and the fruitfulness and you know just the overall growth of the vine. So uh, yeah, it would all come down to water how much water you have to apply for the landscape. Would, would um, any of you, sorry, I had to switch my microphone. Is it okay right now? Um, would, yes. would any of you have a comment for Maria's question or Maria, you could turn your microphone on if you'd like and ask yourself. Hi, yeah, this is just a general question because I've had like wines that are essentially like the same, but from different vintages. So I was just wondering if the particular weather between different years is the most prominent factor affecting the overall vintage result. Thank you. I have the same question. I second her question. I, I think of the reason they put the vintage on the bottle, this is my take on it. 
but it's because sometimes the weather is so severe, it's a miracle. So it's like a miracle year that there was even wine if the weather's really bad. Or you think of all the wars going on and things like that. So um, I really, I like to pay attention to the vintage a lot. It, it's very, it's a, it's a snapshot. It's a, it's a picture of life in the vineyard in one particular year. And you have to put in who, who the people were too involved with that. So it's like a photo album in a way. But I'd like to hear what y'all have to say. <laughs> I would also like to hear uh, Tiffany from the winemaker's point of view. What, what is your, so, so Fran's, I think if I'm, in, if I'm understanding correctly, Fran's giving, coming from more of the growing point of view and Tiffany's more, once you've grown it, what do we do with it point of view? What, what, what do you think, Tiffany? Um, definitely whether also um, the quality of grapes that are coming in to the, to the winery. Um, and then there are, you know, like with the winemaker tools and tricks that we can use to, you know, ameliorate that and, you know, hopefully still save a vintage, <laughs> have a good vintage, um, a good wine produced. Um, but it can affect yield. Um, you know, if we've got commitments to uh, restaurants or, um, you know, HEB, different grocery store chains that we can't fulfill those orders, that's obviously going to affect that we might not be able to produce something that we wanted to um if it's you know um dry uh that's usually good um maybe rot and things if there's um weather events that happen that year that cause rot like uh, hail storms could be one that would you know break open um grapes for special maturing in the latter days right before you're bringing them in and harvesting them um, that could affect the winemaking downstream. It could be very beneficial. Um, so, Tiffany, um, what about how you change wine styles from based on how the crop looks when you get it? That might have. What do? You, what would you say about that? Um, I mean, I guess in certain circumstances, yeah, I mean, you can always say court. <laughs> court could change. Will you hold the microphone up to your mouth? I don't, is this, I'm, I'm, is that better? I'm sorry. I'm kind of nervous. You know, to, what I to let like everyone that. know, we've been trying to fix Tiffany's sound issues. We're, <laughs> we're trying. It, it sounds, what we hear is like, it almost sounds like someone's vacuuming in the background or something. That is so weird. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that, guys. Really apologize. But um, yeah, so pork. We, we, we do produce port and if, if we, we make port from two different grape varieties, I suppose if those came in and they weren't optimal for our Pont du Bois program, we could make more port. That would be an example of how to, you know, give it lemons, make lemonade. <laughs> um, there's different yeast choices that you can, some, some yeast, um, if you are afraid you might have a, get a speck fermentation, um, you can use, you know, really high tolerant yeast uh, for situations that will get you a fermented product at least, and then you can maybe pump it up. Um, but definitely whether, um, and I really like Fran's look on vintage being a snapshot in a photo album. I love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, guys, again, for the issues with my microphone. We're bearing with it. We're bearing with you. It's worth it. Um, OK, so at this point, if it hadn't been clear that this happened naturally, I think we've transitioned into our networking portion. And so I would go ahead and encourage everybody to turn on their cameras if they would like, do exactly like Maria was just doing and show us your wine that you're still drinking. <laughs> oh yeah, let's do a group. Wait, can we quickly do a group like cheers and we'll take a screenshot? That would be a lot of fun actually. Let me, let me fill my wine glass back up. It can't be empty. 
All right. Um, so everybody hold up your glass. Let's take, I'm going to take a screenshot. I see camera still turning on. Thank you, everyone. All right. One, two, three. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really bad timing. All right. That is a wonderful picture. I'll take one more just in case. Sorry, I know everyone was already drinking when I said that. I'll do better at my counting this time. One, two, three. All right, I've got it. Thank you, everybody. Um, that's not the end of this event, by the way. I just wanted to make sure I got everybody's picture. And you went back to a white wine. <laughs> I don't know if anyone noticed. So I um, am quite embarrassed to say that I have been really, really busy this week. Um, to the point that I have not done any shopping, including food, let alone wine. And so uh, my partner and I have been eating rice for the last couple of meals because we've just been that busy. We haven't gone grocery shopping. And I also could not go wine shopping. So I've been drinking one bottle of wine this whole time. I'm embarrassed, guys. I apologize. But I've really enjoyed watching you all enjoy all of the wines. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up a few breakout rooms so we can break up into smaller groups and have some chats. Um, you should be able to jump around between the rooms if you'd like to. Um, so feel free to, to chat with everybody and we'll leave them open and tell people feel like heading out. So I'm going to go ahead and start those. 